Hello, and this is Terry with Futures IO, and as always, I would like to thank you for joining us today. It is my pleasure to welcome David Lerman and John Bria from CB Group for today's webinar, Trading Energy Options. This is sponsored by Iron Beam Futures. Throughout the webinar, if you have a question, please feel free to type them into the questions box. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the futures.io website within 24 to 48 hours. If you're watching this afterwards on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a like, sh uh, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. It really helps us a lot. For trading news, events, information, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using at futures.io. And now, without further delay, I'll hand it over to David, and Mike will give a little uh, introduction. Thanks, Terry. Um, thanks for having us on the site, and thanks to David and John over at CME for putting together this presentation. I don't want to take up too much time at the top. We'll do a quick uh, Q&A after the presentation, but I'll just turn it over to David. Thanks very much. I'm going to assume you can see my screen and hear my voice, correct? Yes, sir. Looks good. She's all yours. All right. Thank you. Quick disclaimer uh, here on behalf of the CME, futures and options trading is not suitable for all investors, and each involves the risk of loss. So as we always say, do your homework. Please do your homework. All right. Quick, uh, quick bullet point update on the energy markets. Uh, they are definitely, they've been in a major transition for 2020 has been a major transition for pretty much every asset class. Uh, energy uh, wasn't spared volatility at all. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a, just a confluence of factors that just killed the energy market uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, we had, you know, the United States, the Russia, and the uh, Saudi Arabia were the three largest producers. Well, we have this pandemic, global demand plunged, and as at the exact same time, Saudi Arabia and Russia decided to get into a price war and just start oversupplying the world oil markets. The two of them together took oil prices down by 70, 80%, and at one point they went negative for WTI. So it's interesting. Um, so North America, we took the lead in supplying new global demand, so that helped the supply thing. Um, WTI and LNG are, are keys in the transition going forward. Uh, WTI used to be pretty much a North American benchmark, but now it's, it's a global benchmark along with Brent crude. Uh, liquefied natural gas is gonna be very, very important because the United States is a very large producer of natural gas. Uh, the US, along with the um, of Russia, are two of the biggest gas producers in the world. Um, OPEC, uh, no longer, uh, they're still in control, but they're not as in as much control as they used to be, so to speak. Uh, and it's now the US shale producers versus everybody else. Um, uh, recent, uh, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, advances in fracking or hydraulic fracturing uh, that liberated large amounts of oil and gas from shale rock formations helped make the United States the biggest producer of oil and gas in the world, pretty much. Uh, coal and fuel, uh, they are very controversial and it'll be interesting with a new administration that uh, wants to transition out of fossil fuel sooner rather than later, um, but it is a big environmental concern. Coal is just dirty, fuel oil is dirtier than natural gas or nuclear or some other uh, alternatives. And renewable energy is starting to be competitive. Uh, I follow utility stocks. This is a sideline. I'm getting old and uh, old people do uh, utility stocks sometimes. Um, just, just kidding there, uh, but I am getting old. Uh, so renewable energy, I, I've noticed some of the utilities have a substantial amount of their power production from renewable energy. So this is uh, very interesting how this is going to pan out. And the more it becomes mainstream, the less demand for fossil fuels, obviously. Um, Asia uh, has completely changed the entire equation, uh, not only for trade routes, and but their usage of WTI and Brent is 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 huge. Um, absent the pandemic, China is the second largest economy in the world now, and they're expected to overtake the United States in less than a decade, decade and a half, probably even sooner than that, depending. And uh, COVID-19 brings demand destruction, which we already talked about. Airlines were flying only 20% of capacity. Everybody was off the road. No one was driving. There was just a huge, huge oversupply, and then demand dropped out of this, just fell through the basement, so to speak. Just a little history uh, going back, uh, let's see, how far does this go, about a year or so? Uh, and you can see, uh, it's the year ending October 29th, 2020, and you can see 
Crude oil, really, it's, it's been in a nice rectangular formation between basically 35 and 45 since eh, basically late spring, early summer. After a tumultuous plunge from 60 down to 30 and 25 and even going negative for a little bit. Uh, you can see we've been, uh, we haven't broken out of the range yet. Uh, we, we started falling precipitously a couple of weeks ago down towards 35, but then we rallied dramatically uh, on one news of a possible vaccine, which would reopen the economy a little bit faster. And um, just news of, um, you know, the different administration, the elections and things like that, we rallied back up to over 40. So it's very interesting. The volatility is, uh, the potential for volatility is amazing. And we'll look at some of those things too, in terms of crude oil and natural gas, where volatility has been, some of the historic highs and things like that, when we talk about volatility percentile rankings. Natural gas, totally different story. And again, this is this is uh, more of the clean energy type theme here, but natural gas had um, declined from 10 down to like one or two. And now it's finally making its way back up. It's uh, made it above three. And uh, it'll be interesting to see, uh, is it presaging a very, very cold winter or is it just a supply and demand fluctuation thing here? Is it, uh, you know, we don't know. Is it, was it someone thinking that a democratic administration would uh, want more clean uh, energy and natural gas is cleaner than uh, other fossil fuels? So we'll see uh, and we'll keep monitoring this and uh, as we move on here. All right, so a couple of things, a little background here on, uh, some of the volumes and where they're coming from and uh, things like that. So we have WTI growth driven by non-US customers and options expansion. So where, you know, how do we, obviously volatility has helped the oil markets, um, but how has, how, how have things grown? So we have energy futures here in blue, energy options in gold, and you can see uh, they continue, options continue to outperform futures. They represent 7% of total energy volumes versus 1.5% in 2009. Uh, we're global customers, they're uh, increasingly adopting CMI, CME's WTI options with non-US volumes increasing up to 20% of overall volume. So we're gonna have a chart that'll show that later. But uh, it's one thing to have liquidity in the United States and the North American time zone. If you're American domiciled, uh, then you would want to uh, have good liquidity there. But what if you're an Asian trader or you are a European time zone trader? You'd want liquidity in other time zones too. And this is what we have on this next chart here. Uh, it shows growth and non-US hours activity in WTI crude oil. So you can see there, the one that matters the most is that uh, that solid line that cuts through everything there. Um, we have the US hours and non-US hours, percent non-US hours. Um, it's really interesting there. The percentage of uh, trading going on outside the United States is now up to 25%. So fully a quarter of our volume comes from outside the United States. So uh, non-US volumes now account for 24% of West Texas Intermediate uh, volume. So that's up from 7% just about 10 or 11 years ago. So that's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, it it's truly is a worldwide benchmark and it truly is gaining liquidity in all time zones. And that's important. I'm gonna skip this page here because it's uh, pretty much the same. All right, so natural gas options. Uh, it's been pretty steady. They have spikes upward in average daily volume, then they come down. It's kind of a cyclical thing. I wonder if it has to do with winter. Hmm. Uh, there's a seasonal bias sometimes in natural gas, and we're actually seeing it in the price of natural gas now when you saw that chart a, a couple minutes ago. But still, open interest is still very solid. It's over 2.5 million contracts. That's, that's pretty incredible. Anytime you get a futures contract with open interest of a million or average daily volume of hundreds of thousands, you got a mega contract on your hand and you actually have pretty good liquidity. So the average daily volume is somewhere around, eh, right around 200,000, uh, open interest is more than 10 times that. So uh, it's pretty incredible how the energy markets have evolved over the last few years. Uh, although there hasn't been a lot of growth in natural gas, um, that could change. We start to get back up to those some of those old highs of you know, five, 10, 15 years ago, we're gonna be doing a lot more volume and open interest is certain to grow. One of the things that's propelled the interest in the energy markets is uh, weekly, weekly options. And we'll have, we'll have more to say about this later, but uh, people had to trade monthly or quarterly options. Well, what if you had, what if you were an event driven trader? In other words, you wanted to trade based off, um, you know, let's say tomorrow's EIA report, Energy Information Administration. And let's say you were really, really bullish and you thought that the, you know, the, the, 
EIA report would be, you know, bullish. It would, it would contribute to a rise in crude oil or natural gas or something like that. Well, now with weekly options, you can do that. You can trade weekly options. You have more flexibility and, and, and they're cheaper premium. And there's a whole bunch of good advantages that we're going to talk about when we get to that section. This is a section from, uh, I'm going to show different ways to ex to, to find out expirations, or I want to, I'm not, I don't want to throw a lot of information at you just for the sake of throwing information at you. I just want you to be able to get it at multiple places and learn how to read these things in multiple formats. So this comes from the CME Group website, and it shows the monthly crude oil CL. Uh, this is West West Texas Intermediate, uh, the options expiration calendar, and so you see there December 2020. The product code is LOZ20. So LO is uh, crude oil options. Z is December 20th, 2020. So it's December 2020. Interestingly, though, uh, that was first available to trade November of 2011. The last trade date and the settlement date will be November 17th this month, about a week from now, um, in 2020. So interesting, the monthly options, they go out in the month before the actual futures do. So you have a December expiration, it stops trading in November, all right? So you have to be aware of that. This happens in treasury bonds too, in treasury notes. The options actually expire a, uh, a month before, or several weeks before the main contract month. So there, January 21, 2021, you can see they go off in December. February, they go off in January. March, they go off in February, so on and so forth. And that's why I put these up here so you can kind of see. All right, weekly options. So we have crude oil, now we have weekly. Before we had monthly, we have weekly. Now a lot of these expired because you can see October 2020, LO3V. Uh, LO3 is uh, crude oil, the three is the week three, and V is October. So it's October week three, 2020. Those go actually go off the board in the contract month that they're listed. So if it says October 2020, the last trade is the third week of October, it's October 16th. The next one, LOV. LO4V, excuse me, LO4V, that's the week, fourth weekly October option. And it goes off October 23rd. And you can see all the way down there every uh, week, October 23rd, October 30th, November 6th, November 13th, November 20th, and November 27th in that third column, first trade, last trade. And we have weeklies listed that go, you know, uh, several months or, you know, they spike, they expand, maybe six, you'll see on a calendar coming up you'll see we list maybe six weeklies, five weeklies at a time, but you'll get the idea when I show you a different calendar, it's a different format. So obviously the Octobers are off, gone off the board. Uh, the first week November is off the board. The second uh, November weekly is the 13th that goes off the board, which is this Friday. So that will expire this Friday. And then uh, the week, November week three and November week four still will trade until November 20th and November 20th seventh respectively all right so this is uh from quick strike you can actually get this off our website too um for options expiration you can get all our options expirations <clears throat> excuse me in this format all right so you can see here i have october november and december you can see when the options will first trade uh, some of them won't start trading till next week, November 16th. Some of them are already trading. Again, this is just a different format. It shows exactly the same things that I showed you before in the last two slides. I just wanted to give it to you in a different format because maybe you want to go out past, you know, November or December. You want to go to January and you can do that. All right. So if all the expirations are available, they don't start trading sometimes for another couple of weeks. So, for example, the first trade date is November 16th for the uh, week two December option. So um, that's down there in December. So it seems confusing at first, but once you start trading these things, this is why I show people. I think the one on the CME website, the first two that I showed you is a little more clear. This one becomes clear when you this this format is clear when you work with it for a while. Uh, and then we have natural gas, LN, same thing. Uh, you can go October, November, December. You can go into January if you want. It shows the first trade date. It shows the options expiration. It shows the product. Days to expiration, DTE is days to expiration. So you have an idea of how many days to expiration there are. It gives you the option, the future, the future's expiration, and the days to expiration of the future. All right, so it's different. The days to expiration of the future are sometimes different than the days to expiration for the option. All right. So 
let's look at our first major topic that we're going to talk about here. This seminar should go somewhere around 40, 45 minutes. I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes I talk faster. Sometimes I skip through slides, but it'll be at least 30 minutes, probably 40. So we'll allow lots of time for questions afterwards. This is a chart of implied volatility. Now, the scale looks a little strange because we had an anomaly. Again, when you go to negative interest rates, when you go from $60 a barrel down to $30 a barrel, down to $20 a barrel, then you go to zero and then negative, volatility skyrockets. And I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> Even the crash of 1987 in the US stock market, volatility intraday made it into triple digits. I've seen triple digit volatility in the crude oil market, but only 140% at its high. For a couple of days, we exceeded 200, 250% and made it above 300%. We made it to 340%. Volatility. To give you an idea the, of the impact this, this has on an options premium, we're going to show you in a second on the volatility percentile rankings. But this, these charts are good. They're very useful. You can see what's low volatility. You can see what's high volatility. You can kind of draw an imaginary line through all that stuff and get average volatility. But if you want to drill down and get a little bit more granularity in what's um, cheap volatility versus what's expensive versus what's obscene, uh, we uh, have something called volatility percentile rankings. And anyone that's listened to any of my options seminars, I've gone over this endlessly. You're probably tired of it, but you, know, you shouldn't be because this is, this is it. This is one of the key inputs to options premiums. And if you get this wrong, it's going to be really, really hard to have optimal results over the long run. You may get lucky ignoring volatility a couple of times, but over the long run, it'll get you if you don't pay attention to it. It's one of the, you know, the thing we always talk about also at the CME group is that Options are four-dimensional instruments. You, you, futures are you know, up and down, two-dimensional. With options, you have to worry about time to expiration and changes in implied volatility. Uh, so you gotta balance, you gotta keep four plates spinning in the air. So these are percentile rankings. Uh, I'll set it up by saying they're very akin to college entrance exams. If you uh, took your SAT test, or your a ACT test, the SAT, uh, if you got 800, you did really, really good. So let's just say you got 790 on the math part of your SAT. You would get overall score, and then you would get a percentile ranking. So 790 is the raw score. The percentile ranking would have been 98th percentile, meaning you beat 98% of the people that took the test, all right? Uh, only 2% did better than you. Probably went to a very good college, very prestigious college. If you scored a 400, you were in the 35th percentile and 65% of the people that took the test beat you. You probably either took the test again or, I don't know, uh, you went somewhere else for college because uh, at the 35th percentile, there's not a lot of prestigious schools that would accept you, but that doesn't matter. Some of the best traders I know are high school dropouts, believe it or not. Uh, so there's no correlation. Uh, Jack Schwager did this in some of his books, but there's no correlation between super, super intelligence and super success in uh, trading. I've only known one mathematical genius that just tore the cover off the ball when it comes to futures and options trading and derivatives trading. And that was Jim Simons of Renaissance Capital. He was a math whiz, went to MIT and all that stuff. But in general, options lend themselves to math and statistics. So it made sense for him. But not a lot of people duplicate that. So you can do very, very well without having an IQ of 200. All right, so back to the percentile rankings. Um, the high, again, this is three years ending October 12th. And by the way, this is three years of data. It's not stale, even though we're almost at November 12th. These numbers are the same. The low is the same. The high is the same. As far as I know, in the last two weeks, volatility hasn't gone above 344% in crude oil. So the 90th percentile is 55. The 75th percentile is 38%, okay? If volatility gets 29%, it would rank in the 50th percentile. If it's 24.59, it's the 25th percentile. The very lowest in the last three years is 15.73. Uh, current, when I made this slide back on October 29th, it was 59.71 for crude oil, which puts you in about the 92nd percentile, meaning 8% uh, of the time, only 8% of the time volatility is higher, 92% of the time volatility is lower. Now, those that have traded options before, uh, those that haven't, you're going to learn a lesson. When volatility goes down, it, it uh, has a negative impact on your uh, premiums, okay? When volatility goes down, it has a negative impact on premiums. Lower volatility on long options 
will have an adverse impact on your options premium. So you want volatility to go up after you buy an option, all right? And at the 92nd percentile, that means 8% uh, of the time it's higher, 92% of the time it's lower. Uh, so if it's lower 92% of the time, statistics are against you. And that's the whole thing about options. You want to you want tailwinds. You want to set up tailwinds. And statistically speaking, you didn't have a tailwind buying options when they're in the 92nd percentile. The only time you made money is if you know we went up to you know 70, 80, 90 uh, percent volatility, which would take you back to the 99th percentile or 98th percentile. Now, it, at this point, it's all words, and I'm just shooting my mouth off. But the important part is the third column: the at the money straddle in points and in dollars. Look at the difference between that high volatility, 344. Look at the difference in the price of a straddle and look at the, just the 90th percentile. Normally, there's not that much of a gap between the high and the 90th percentile. But given what happened with the global pandemic and the demand drop, look at the difference. A straddle would have cost 29.91 at 344.63% volatility. It only costs 5.10 or $5,100. So you have a 29 or almost a $30,000 straddle if you bought straddles at the high. If you waited to the 90th percentile, you got a very nice discount. You only pay $5,100 for that same straddle. I mean, $29,900 for a straddle, that's, that's practically the price of crude oil for most of the year. That's a very expensive straddle. You're paying high insurance rate, so to speak. This is like a 16-year-old trying to get insurance on a Corvette. It ain't going to happen. And if you can get it, it's going to cost four or $5,000 because not trying to offend any teenagers out there, but they're destined to do something foolish behind the wheel of a car. Insurance companies know this. They have all the statistics, all the data, and there's more risk insuring a 16-year-old. They account, they're not that great a popular part of the population, but they account for a very significant amount of um, auto accidents, fatal and non-fatal. So as a result, the premiums are a lot more. Same thing with options. If there's more risk, and believe it, when, <laughs> when uh, crude oil goes from 60 and gets cut in half and then gets cut in half again and then goes negative, there's a lot of risk. So therefore, options premium buyers will pay more. P sellers, premium sellers will demand more. All right. So the whole point of these volatility percentile rankings is to try and gauge. You want to buy options when they're cheaper. You want to try and buy below the 50th percentile if you can. You, ideally, if you can get them in the 25th or 10th percentile, that's ideal. That's the best. Although those, those trades don't come around all that often. You, you're either in a lower volatility environment and we get out of it, you know, they're mean reverting. Volatility is mean reverting. You head up towards the 50th percentile or volatility gets really, really high and it comes back down to a more normal level. But when you get the 90th percentile or down to the 10th percentile, you get, statistically speaking, the odds are weighed in your favor. You get a little bit more of a tailwind. So ideally, um, and by the way, let's just say we go from the 10th percentile to the 25th percentile. Volatility goes from 22.61 to 24.59, all right? Look at the straddle. It goes from 2140 to 2320. So in this case, if volatility goes from 22.61 up to 24.59, you make money, right? Does Dave Lerman guarantee you a profit if you get volatility right? No. Remember I said options are four-dimensional instruments. What if it takes a month to go from 22.61 to 24.59? What if it takes two months? Well, the increase in volatility is going to be offset now by time decay. Options have time decay. Every day that goes by, they waste away. So you're going to have time decay working against your increase in volatility. And we have later on, we're going to show some quick strike. It's an options analytic tool. You can see how volatility affects your option, how time decay affects your option. And you can do a lot of really good uh, what if scenarios. So that's the point I'm trying to make. The crux of the matter is try to buy options in the lower percentile rankings. And when you want to sell options, and there are people out there that have deep accounts and good risk management, and I suggest that you have a deep account, a big account, big wallet, uh, and uh, good risk management, very good risk management if you wanted to sell options. Some firms will let you do it, but the margin will be very, very high. And that's understandable. Um, because there's upside risk, unlimited upside risk. And if you want to sell options, do it in the higher percentile ranking. Um, just remember, just because we're in the 90th percentile, 
just because we're in the 90th percentile doesn't mean we can't go higher. All right, we can go from the 90th to the 99th percentile. In the case of crude oil, we hit the 90th percentile. A lot of people said, wow, premiums are really expensive. Let's not buy anything here. Let's consider selling. And uh, that strata went from $5,100 to almost 30000 So uh, this can happen sometimes. You have to be very, very careful, especially in the commodity markets where, you know, you have OPEC, you have the former Soviet Union, Russia, you have the United States. And uh, OPEC has immense power, not as much as it used to be, but still very, very powerful. All right. On to natural gas, same thing. Uh, we're gonna do the same thing here. We're just not gonna go through it in detail, but I'm gonna show you a case study. I and mean, I won't mention the name of the firm. You guys can go research it on your own. <laughs> Many of you probably know, but uh, we're not gonna badmouth anyone. That's not what we're here. We're here to educate and to learn. Uh, so we have at the money implied volatility. Again, look at what happened in 2018, the latter part of 2018. Volatility skyrocketed up to 125%. Uh, then it came way, way down, but you could see their lowest volatility in the history of natural gas. This is going back three years, but I went back 10 years on my own. Volatility never got below 18 and a half, 19 percent. If you're in the, if you're at uh, volatility at 18 or 19 percent, you are in the first percentile. All right, keep that in mind. All right, so you can see what's high, what's low. Anything above 50, 60 is getting pretty high. Yeah, 80 is getting really high. 120 is historic high. When you're getting into the 2025 area, you're very, very low. When you get in the teens, you are at historic lows. So let's look here. Uh, I'm not going to go over every piece of data, but here, there's, there's that. The money implied volatility at the high, 125. The low, 3.74. That is a uh, typographical error. Uh, the, the low should actually be 18.5. So my apologies. I got to fix that. The low is 18.5. Um, current, as of October 29th, it was 64.22, which puts it at about the 82nd percentile. So again, crude oil, WTI, and natural gas are all in the 80th and 90th percentile. You're going to pay a hefty premium, excuse the pun, for your options. So if you buy straddles, you buy strangles, you buy calls, you buy puts, you're going to pay a little more than normal, all right, because we're in the higher percentiles. All right, so let me show you what happens when you ignore these things and you, you go against statistics, all right? All right, the impact of volatility spike on options premiums. All right, in September 2018, natural gas implied vol hit the lowest on record. It was in the first percentile. 99% of the time, volatility goes higher. Probability and statistics favored trading from the long premium side. Even a move to more normal volatility level brought nice gains to long natural gas options holders, if you were long. But we had an upside explosion in natural gas futures and volatility. The longs did well, the shorts didn't do so well. So let's look at uh, the case study. This is an actual case, these are actual premiums. This is an actual firm that sold, sold thousands of options in the first percentile or around the first percentile. They sold very, very, very low levels of volatility. And uh, their clients, actually their clients are the ones that sold it. But uh, so this is just a, like a you know two, three week period in November of 2018. You can see the natural gas futures in the second column at the money implied volatility, then the 350 natural gas call and the 350 natural gas call in dollar terms. So we have premium terms, dollar terms, and I have the $4 natural gas premium and dollar terms too. But I just want you to start looking at these things from November 1st to November 8th. We go from 40 to 46% volatility. Look at the premium goes from 14.1481, which is $1,481. Now November 8th, now it's 2,779. The premiums basically doubled. If you were short these things, you lost a lot of money, but wait, we're not done. Go to November 16th, Friday, November 16th. Volatility is at 98%. The premiums are at 92.57. Now, in defense of a trader here, you probably get a margin call long before this. If you shorted something at $1,481 and it's now trading at 92.57, you either got out or your firm sold you out. You'd get a margin call. Just look at a couple more days later, though, November 19th, over the weekend, volatility spikes up higher still. We were already in the 99th percentile, and now we went to the 99.9th percentile. Um, 
it's possible. It's happened in a couple of markets. And look at the value of that straddle now, 13,000. It's gone up almost tenfold. So again, not paying attention to volatility can cause you losses. And if you really botched volatility and you sell the first percentile and it goes up to the 99th percentile in three weeks uh, or in a couple of months, uh, you're gonna have substantial losses. Again, you probably get a margin call at that point. Um, and there's things you can do um, long before that point. But the whole point is keep an eye on volatility. Never, ever, ever sell vol volatility when it's in the 10th percentile or lower. Try to avoid buying volatility when it's in the 85th, 90th, 95th percentile or higher, because this is gonna be really hard to make money. I mean, it's gonna be really, really hard to make money, right? All right, I'm gonna take a little drink of water here and then we'll continue with uh, the gamma theta trade-off. All right, so weekly options. We talked about weekly options. And one of the great things, they're terrific for trading event-driven strategies. So, but you know, you gotta ask the question, why would someone trade short-term options with high time decay? You know, you got an option, it's got a week to expiration, a couple days to expiration. If nothing happens, the time decay is gonna, you know, really get this option. Well, again, you're if you're strategizing for an event, some news announcement coming up, you know, on Monday or on Wednesday or whatever, it's 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 good to know the in the old days we had to trade quarterly options or monthly options. Well, now we have weekly options, so we want to um, trade off some uh, opinion of some event coming up in the next week. You can do it, and so I have the November, October week third. October week four, October week five, and December. Now, one of these has gone off already. Another one's going off really, really, actually several of these have gone off. All the Octobers have gone off. The December option goes off uh, November 17th, all right? But let's just pretend we're back in October. And you can see a crude oil 41 call option. Look at the premiums. The November option, which the nearby expiration there, goes off in October, was at 41 cents. The October week three, 72 cents, the October week four, 122, and the December option, 223. Notice the difference, $410 in premium versus 22.30. Let's say some announcement was coming out on October 14th or 15th. What would you rather do? If you were playing only that announcement, if you were only taking an opinion on where that announcement was gonna lead oil to or natural gas or whatever, would you rather pay 410 bucks or 22.30? You have a lot less at risk you have a lot more time decay, that's an offset, all right? But you have a lot less risk, uh, you have a higher break-even point, and you have a higher gamma, okay? We'll talk about gamma a little bit later, but gamma is, is uh, when you have a nearby option, a weekly option, uh, as it gets more and more in the money, it's delta gains uh, value faster and faster. It'll go from a 50 delta to a 60 delta to an 80 delta, much faster than a regular option. That's called gamma. So weekly options give you less upfront premium, therefore less risk. You have higher gamma, you have a lot of expiration choices, but you have higher theta, you have higher time decay for those that are long options. So that's something that uh, people should consider. Um, it's, uh, they're very good, they're very flexible. There's a lot of them, there's very good liquidity. One of the mainstays of our options product growth in the last year or two is weekly options in every product, not just energies, but in, um, treasuries, uh, stock market, uh, E-minis and the micros, uh, you have weekly options and they afford traders a lot of flexibility. <coughs> All right, so let's get the quick strike here. Key points, options require four dimensional thinking, which we talked about. With options, you need to monitor the up and down of the underlying as well as time decay and the impact of implied volatility. Just remember the natural gas option if you uh, wanna remember the impact of implied volatility. Remember the 344% in crude oil and what it did to the straddle, all right? Using options analytics can help harness the multidimensional nature of options. Now, when I first started trading treasury bond options on the floor of the Board of Trade, uh, options analytics software cost thousands of dollars. Now, the, uh, the Merck allow, offers this stuff for free uh, via Quick Strike, okay? So hold on one second here. So um, let me just switch the page here. All right, so before you execute any trade with options, you should identify the following. This is basics. This is, I teach this in a basic class too. Maximum loss, 
maximum potential gain, implied volatility of the option in terms of high, low average, impact of a 1% change in implied volatility, impact of time decay, and sensitivity of options to underlying future. You knowing these things before you initiate a trade can lead to more optimal results. Quick strike can help determine these variables. All right, so um, here you go. This is uh, one of the, this is a print screen of, of Quick Strike. And it shows the premium, okay? It shows the future. It shows the days to expiration, 28. It shows the, um, it gives you volatility, gives you a premium. Down in the rectangular, the red rectangle, you can see the Greeks. You can see theta, that's time decay. It's negative because anyone that buys options has negative time decay. Time decay works against you. The Vegas 0.045, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. The gamma is 8.14, the delta is 54.9. Now, we're gonna go over all these with the remaining time in the seminar, and then we'll uh, wrap it up and take questions. So the premium's 209, all right? The delta is 54.9, the gamma is 8.1. Delta just tells you how much your underlying, uh, your options are gonna move relative to the underlying futures. If the underlying futures moves up 10 ticks, the option's gonna move about 5.5 ticks or five and a half, five or six ticks, all right? So let's change, let's see if I did this right here. Let's change, the future's 41.32. This is the great thing about options analytics. You can, um, you can do simulation. So let's simulate a rally from crude oil to 41.32 to 41.42, all right? We rallied 10 ticks. Look at the premium. It went from 209 to 214. It went up five ticks, which is what the Delta told us would happen. It would move up about five, five and a half ticks. Uh, so again, you can kind of figure out where you're going to go here. You can look at all four dimensions and do any scenario you want. Crude oil volatility up, crude oil futures up dramatically. You can put in any simulation you want. This is uh, pretty good. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And all right, we're back to 41.32 for the futures. We went back to the, the first scenario and the premiums back to 209. All right, well, let's change another scenario now. Days to expiration, all right? The premium has shrunk from 209 to 205. How could we know that? That's, that's about four ticks, 209 to 205, four ticks. See the theta, negative 0.035. The theta would tell us that we lose about three and a half ticks, four ticks, if you wanna round up. We lose four ticks every day that goes by. I changed the days to expiration from 28 to 27, okay? I just made the sun go around, or the earth go around the sun, or excuse me, the earth go around the axis in two seconds. Um, so yeah, you can change this. You know, how will this look a week from now? How will this look a month from now? How will it look a week from now if volatility goes down? This is the great thing about quick strike. You can do this. So theta is, it's, uh, everything's in ticks here. So three and a half ticks. Um, you can multiply by the contract specs to get the actual dollar amount. And sometimes you can change within the software. You can go from ticks to dollar premiums. This is 205. This is a $2,050 premium because crude oil is very simple. It's a thousand barrels. So two times a thousand, 2,050 bucks. All right. Let's see what the next slide says. All right. Remember now Vega shows you the impact of implied volatility here. Okay. If implied volatility, it shows you the impact of a one percentage point change in volatility. Remember, one percentage point change. So volatility goes from 41.48 to 40.48, that's a one percentage point change, or up to 42.48, that's a one percentage point change. The Vegas 0.044, so that's four ticks for every one percentage point change in volatility, you're gonna be roughly four, four and a half ticks are gonna be added or subtracted from this premium. So let's see what happens. Oh, we went back to days to expiration at 28. All right, I'm gonna go one more slide ahead. There we go. We went from 41.48, we took one percentage point off of volatility. So volatility decreased one full percentage point. Look at the premium now down another four, four and a half ticks to 204, all right? So these Greeks, Vega is not really a Greek uh, letter, but these, this is what Quick Strike could do. It could tell you how your option is gonna look. And this is just for a one lot. This is a one lot long call. If you have a more complicated position, straddle, strangle, ratio, spread, butterflies, 
it will calculate all your break evens, it will calculate all your deltas, all your gammas, all your thetas, all your vegas, and all that stuff. It'll do it on your whole position. In the old days, you had to do it by hand. Think of that. You're an options trader, the market's moving, and you had to sit there and you know, figure out things. Well, software makes this much, much easier on the trader. All right, so let's look at the next slide and see what's changed. Okay, days to expiration, 21. So I frame shifted, I just took a time machine and went ahead by a week. Volatility is now down to 39.48. It's gone from 41.48 to 39.48. Uh, so we've lost two full percentage points in volatility, all right? And we lost seven days to time decay. How's the premium gonna look? 1.75, it's gone from 209 to 175. I get calls, I get emails now. I bought these options, the underlying went up, but I didn't make any money <laughs> or the, you know, the option, the future didn't do anything. And yet I lost a substantial amount of premium. Well, the reason why is because you had a, a, another week of time decay and you had two full percentage points of vega or volatility impact. And this is, I explain this to the boards at pension funds, bank trading desks. You have to look at the four dimensions of option. You can't look at just one dimension and expect to have optimal results, all right? So you can use a quick strike here uh, for a lot of things, but what can we learn? Market makers can teach us a lot. Even if most of us will never trade as much as a market maker, it doesn't matter. You can still learn about risk management. So I used to be a market maker and I know market makers. Um, Anyways, let's just take a scenario. October 21st, you're an options market maker, you make two-sided markets to facilitate liquidity in crude oil. The December at the money straddle implied volatility stands at 43, placing it in the 77th percentile. Only 23% of the time has volatility been higher. The market for the December 40 straddle, all right, is 30, 371 bid, 375 offer. Your offer is at the top of the book. So if someone wants to buy at the market, it's coming off your order, all right? It's gonna be your order, you're gonna be, that's your offer. A trader takes your offer of 375 on 100 contracts, all right? Could be a hedge fund, could be a trader, could be, you know, whatever. You're short now 100 December 40 straddles at 375. Your Vega is minus 8,660 points. <laughs> excuse me, dollars, or excuse me, your Vega is 8.66 points. That is for each one percentage point change in volatility, it will gain or lose $8,860. Remember, you did a hundred lot, all right? It's a very large trade in crude oil. So $8,660, uh, that's a huge amount. Um, so what do you do? You're a market maker, you, if volatility goes up, by the way, volatility did go up after August, uh, October 21st. It went from 43% uh, to 59%. So if you were a market maker and you held this short position, these short straddles, um, you got hurt a little bit. All right, so what would you do? You have volatility risk, you have elections coming up, you have a global pandemic. Uh, answer, you know, what would you do? You're short 100, let's just say you're short one. What would you do? You see volatility going up, even though crude oil didn't go up that much, volatility did go up. Actually, crude oil went down from uh, $41 down to 36 and it did it pretty quickly. So volatility crept up. So what's the answer? If you're short volatility or short premium, you offset it with long volatility. So what can you do? Uh, well, here's how it looks, 100 lot. Here's all the Vegas, all right? This is everything that we've been talking about, but now it's a hundred lot. It's a straddle instead of one lot. This, what you could do is buy some out of the money options. You have the 100 straddle here, uh, the 40 strike. You could buy some of the 42 or 44 calls or whatever, and you could buy some of the 39 or 38 puts. You can actually buy a strangle around the straddle and that's one of the things they might do. They might use futures, they may spread it off with other options, but look what happens. Here's the straddle on the left-hand side of the page, a straddle, uh, you could see it's unlimited losses on both sides. If we have a big move down, it could be catastrophic losses. You have an unlimited move upside, you could have very, very substantial losses. As uh, Larry McMillan in his famous book, Options, Assets, Strategic Investment says, losses can mount rapidly. Look at the other thing. This is, uh, it says iron butterfly, but I just had a straddle and then I did some strangles. Uh, so as a market maker, I bought some strangles to offset my short premium. And here you still can make a profit, you know, just like a straddle, but you don't have unlimited risk. The risk is capped off 
uh, at a certain amount by buying the strangles. So this is how market makers sometimes think. And it's one of the great things about options. It lets you adjust on the fly to changing volatility environments. Okay, one other thing that I wanna talk about is for a quick strike is we have open interest heat maps. And you can see the greener it is, the more activity there is. So you can see in some uh, strike prices, some expiration months, you see a lot of green. In other words, you see a lot of volume. Then uh, other places you see it's almost white or very, very, very light green. Uh, so again, just a, another tool that you can use. And uh, we also have it for natural gas. You can have it for many of our products. So it just gives you uh, more data on open interest by expiration and by strike. All right, key takeaways. And then we'll take questions. Pandemic will likely impact the energy markets for the foreseeable future, although global economy seems to be slowly recovering. Although now I made this slide before um, the recent spike in cases around the world, uh, London's in lockdown now, uh, the United States, some cities are locking down. So volatility is still relatively high for natural gas and crude oil, which should provide trading opportunities going forward. Options are four dimensional instruments, along with the up and down movement of the underlying, you must address time decay and the impact of changing volatility. Quick strike can help analyze how your position will react to changing dynamics. Uh, there's the quick strike tool. Go to our education site. Oh, reading list. Uh, if you're just new to options, or even if you're a relative novice, less than a year of experience, get Larry McMillan's book, all right? He sold 500,000 copies, which is nearly impossible for a gigantic options textbook. Um, it's not the most exciting thing to read because options are much more exciting to trade than they are to learn about. Although I found it, I'm a nerd, a geek, whatever, I'm a numbers guy. I found the book very uh, exciting to read. And um, I read it a couple of times as a matter of fact, but trading them is even more fun. Um, Options Volatility by Shelley Natenberg is bent a little bit more towards a professional trader. They're both great books, but I would start with Macmillan. Um, it's very thick, it's expensive, but it is very, very well worth it, okay? Uh, go to our education site where there's uh, cmegroup.com slash education. There's a lot of free modules, free webinars, free everything. Uh, you can get a pretty good education, you know, at least advance your learning curve if you're newer or a novice or less than a couple of years of experience, and uh, it'll help you out. Uh, the folks at Iron Beam Futures IO also, I'm sure, would be happy to help you out with your uh, your learning curve. But we at the Merck uh, assist all our firms, clearing member firms, and firms uh, do whatever is necessary to educate clients. Because without it, uh, you're going to have suboptimal results. So that's it. We'll take questions now. And thank you all for listening. And we'll take some questions. Hey, give me one second to get through them. Hi right, guys, if you have any questions, please start typing them in the questions box and I'll ask them to David. I do have a question myself, um, and it's on the options for the micros. Have those released yet? Options for the micro and mini equities? Yes. Uh, oh yeah, they've they're, they've been trading for since uh, for a couple months now. Okay, okay. I remember I heard something about they're it. They're doing very well too. Okay, awesome. I think they trade about 8,000 a day, which for something that's only two months old is pretty darn good. Nice. And they will grow. Um, as the micro futures grow, the options will probably, probably grow too. Okay. Um, I don't have any questions at the moment. If you have questions, please type them in and I'll ask them to David.
come on, I couldn't have done that good a job. <laughs> or I confused you so much, you don't have any questions. Well, we'll give it 30 more seconds. Yep. Okay, I think that's... Okay, uh, there's no questions. Uh, thank you for the webinar and information and for spending some time with us this evening, David, John, and Mike. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime.